Anthony Woodcock with GodRolls.net here. Okay, I was just doing a video about the porn topic. As I noticed that Mark Driscoll covers the porn topic at great lengths. And it's Mars Hill Church. And I've seen a lot of his videos here on YouTube. But then I noticed that he also covered the hell topic. Now, there's a lot of Protestants that keep going around telling everybody that Orthodox Universalism is a heresy. But in reality, they don't know what they're talking about. Because most Protestants don't even accept the first seven ecumenical councils. Now, according to the Catholic and Orthodox Church, you must accept these first seven ecumenical councils to even consider yourself Orthodox. But a lot of Protestants don't even accept them. Which, according to certain groups, would make you a heretic. Okay? Which is kind of funny because a lot of Protestants go around telling people who's a heretic and who's not a heretic. Now, I'm not here to call any Protestants a heretic, okay? That's not my goal. My goal is to point out why, what is going on here. I see a muddying of the water. I see people muddying the truth left and right. Rob Bell did not bring forth heresy. If anything, the Calvinists, the hyper-Calvinists bring forth heresy daily, and the church accepts it. They bring forth the heresy that you don't need to repent of your sins and put Christ as Lord of your life. Now, John MacArthur fights against that, which is a good thing. And it appears that Mark Driscoll also fights against that, which is a good thing. But we're talking about orthodoxy, okay? I actually know orthodoxy because I've studied it, okay? A lot of these Protestants haven't studied anything with orthodoxy. They think the Fifth Ecumenical Council Connor Dix uh, or declares uh, orthodox, or uni orthodox Universalism as a heresy. In reality, it does not. And actually, what's so ironic about it is most Protestants don't accept anything past the Fourth Ecumenical Council anyways. But in reality... Let's just assume that these Protestants accept all seven ecumenical councils and they're orthodox. According to them, they think the fifth ecumenical council speaks against universalism. In reality, what was potentially condemned was origin and reincarnation universalism, as I, def as I label it. Basically, pre-existence of souls. It's the idea that you keep coming back as another human being until you get it right, and then you get to heaven. That is the, what was potentially condemned in the Fifth Ecumenical Council. And actually, half the scholars out there literally don't believe that's what happened. Okay? That that wasn't condemned, even though the early church father writings show us in the Fifth Ecumenical Council. The reason why is because the papal documents on this whole topic, because the Pope wasn't there at the Fifth Ecumenical Council, because it's the convening of the whole church, Orthodox, on the east and a Catholic on the west. The Protestants hadn't even been formed yet. Okay? So the Catholic Church wasn't present in the in the essence of the Pope. Okay, so what they did is they sent what was ratified to the Pope for him to sign from the Fifth Ecumenical Council. It was a really about the three chapters as it's called, which is actually again about what almost all the ecumenical councils are about, the Trinity. Okay? So for some reason, though, we have something from Emperor Justinian that's been added into some of the early church father writings from the Fifth Ecumenical Council, which the Pope, uh, which the Pope re Pope's records don't indicate as the case. If you go to the Vatican, they don't have any information from that time indicating that that Origin was condemned or that Universalism was condemned or any of this stuff or reincarnation Universalism as I call it which is pre-existence of souls now even if he was condemned let's say Origen was condemned okay let's say pre-existence of souls was condemned the fact is even if you believe that Universalism as Rob Bell was teaching wasn't condemned wasn't condemned okay because the only thing that does condemn Universalism that was written is something that was tacked on to the end of the Fifth Ecumenical Council's writings by Emperor Justinian, who hated Universalists. Okay? He is not the one who rules anything when it comes to the Ecumenical Councils. He was just trying to influence it. Okay? 
He wrote something 10 years prior to the Fifth Ecumenical Council and tacked it onto the end of the Fifth Ecumenical Council. That is the only document that condemns universalism. Something a emperor wrote, not something that the ecumenical councils ruled on. Okay, Getting that out of the way, you can tell John MacArthur and all those guys they don't know what the hell they're talking about. I just explained what the truth is. Now, they can comment and try to, I mean, they can they can respond to my video. I'd like to see that because they know I'm right, okay? So it's not heresy, period. That Now, that that's out of the way. Let's listen to what Mark Driscoll has to say about the topic. I'm honored to have it and feel the weight of it. So as I teach you today about heaven and hell, uh, I do so as your pastor. I do so as your friend. Um, and I do so trying to tell you the truth, trying to tell you the truth. So I wouldn't be a false teacher or a false prophet. And ultimately, it's your responsibility to make a decision. And to not make a decision is to, in effect, make a tragic decision. And when it comes to issues of... A tragic decision, and what he means by that is he doesn't believe you have an option after you're dead. In reality, only half the church believed this in the early church from 100 A.D. to 300 A.D. Okay, The other half believed that you could get saved after, after you died. Actually, it might have been more than half. And that's where the prayers of the dead come in and all that stuff where the Catholics do and the Orthodox do, which the Protestants reject. Death and what happens following death? Jesus is going to give us instruction. And before we read his words... Uh, which are of supreme authority and importance, I do want to address briefly the options that you have. Not all of them are faithful, but I want to address them so that, number one, you'll know I've done my homework, and number two, if you hold these positions or are inclined toward them, hopefully I might compel you away from them because they're not true. Nonetheless, here are the options regarding the question of what happens when we die. Number one, the naturalist will tell you that you do not have a soul, you are just a body, and when you die, you cease to exist. There is no existence of any sort or kind following your death. That's not true, but many believe that. Number two, the universalists teach that in the end, everyone, or almost everyone, goes to heaven. That hell will be empty or sparsely populated. What a Some joke. will say that all religions lead to God and all paths end in salvation. That's not true. Jesus died because he said differently. Furthermore, there is a Christian, I use that word very loosely, a pseudo-Christian version of this, it's actually a deceptive, false version of this that comes under the guise of Christianity that says, there is an opportunity for post-mortem salvation, that after you die, you can meet Jesus, and eventually ever. Okay, man. Oh, my goodness. So you haven't studied anything. You haven't studied anything, dude. All you've studied is your Sola Scriptura, your Westminster Confession, and your 66 books of the Bible. Written in English by Protestants who have the same theology as you. Okay, that's what you've read. That's what you've studied. You've studied commentaries by someone from the 21st century. Maybe someone from the 20th century, if you're lucky. Or 19th century or something like that. Maybe Adam Clark or you know Matthew Henry. Or, or maybe even a little bit farther back. Maybe you went to Martin Luther. Okay. Martin Luther or John Calvin, ooh, now we're really getting far back, right? 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, you know, whoop de doo Okay, you haven't studied anything from the early church, 100 AD to 300 AD. It's apparently obvious because what you're saying is bullcrap. Because about, according to, according to your own main theologian, the foundation of your whole theology, St. Augustine, which is where John Calvin got total depravity from, According to St. Augustine, there was a lion's share, a large amount of universalists in the church, and he didn't call them heretics. St. Augustine didn't call universalists heretics. Okay? 
And he's the one who came up with this whole flesh burning in hell thing. Eternal torment. He's the guy that came up with it. Okay? Him, and guess where he, they got these ideas from? Where, where did he get these ideas? As I've said in about 100 videos now, it comes from Gnosticism. Gnosticism is where this error originally originates. St. Augustine was a Manichaean Gnostic before he became a Christian. The Gnosticism is what is referred to in 1 John 4 as the Antichrist. He that denies Christ came in the flesh. Gnosticism denies anything good can come from the flesh. That's why they believe Jesus couldn't have been in the flesh. That's why you have in the Marcion heresy, people believing that the God of the Old Testament was to demerge the evil physical God, and that Jesus was the Logos, the spirit God, who couldn't have come in the flesh, because flesh is evil, sex is evil, Flesh needs to be tortured in hell forever. Okay? The Greek philosophers came up with this endless torment idea to get the hordes of, of, of brutish people to act right because you couldn't get them to act right with intellect. So the Greeks came up with this idea of endless punishment that related to your crimes. Okay? This is what led to all this theology in the first place. And St. Augustine said there was a lot of universalists. Clementa Alexandria... St. Gregory and Nicaea, both of those guys are considered Orthodox by the Orthodox Church. They're both saints. Origen's the only one who potentially was condemned, okay? This guy here does not know what he's talking about. He hasn't studied, and this is a joke, okay? This guy is pastor of Mars Hill, where Rob Bell was pastor. And I can tell you Rob Bell knows what I'm talking about, what I'm, all the stuff I'm talking about, he studied. This guy here hasn't studied any of it. That's a that's a gear and frickin' tea. Everyone will be saved because when we die, we'll meet Jesus and our hearts will eventually change. That's not true. Oh, really? Really? I thought God's mercy endures forever. I thought every knee shall bow. So, are you telling me that every knee shall bow? Tell me, how is every knee going to bow? Is God going to force their knee to bow? If God forces their knee to bow, did they really bow? No. Well, if every knee is going to bow, does that, doesn't that mean that they've repented of their sins? For them to bow before Christ, wouldn't it mean that they've changed their ways and repented? Wouldn't it have to mean that? And if it does, does mean that, why would Christ reject them when they repented of their sins? Why would the God of love reject someone who's repented and bowed before him? That's the question you need to ask yourself, Mark Driscoll, the one who hasn't studied the early church fathers, which is apparently clear. Oh, yeah. Some of you will be inclined to believe that. But that's not true. Really? Number three. Wow. Uh, the reincarnationists will tell I like how these, how these preachers, it's just like in Jesus' time with all the religious leaders, all of them leading people astray, tying heavy burdens on their backs. About the Sabbath day in that time, now today it's about the porn topic and any other topic and they can think of, that you're sinning all the time. Okay, what did they make? 10,000 rules around the Ten Commandments? Isn't that what the Pharisees did? If you walk on the Sabbath, you're sinning. If you masturbate, you're sinning. If you look at a nude photo, you're sinning. You that we have multiple successive lives, that you will die and return and die and return and die and return. And Reincarnation. And pay off your karmic debt. Okay, and this is what was condemned potentially in the Fifth Ecumenical Council is reincarnation universalism pre-existence of souls. Now, we are not even sure if Origen was condemned or if even this was condemned in the Fifth Ecumenical Council because scholars disagree about it. And that's from Wikipedia, which is a more balanced resource than, you know, someone who has a propaganda or an agenda to what they're going to say. You see what I'm getting at? God or gods or universe. That's not true. That's not true. Oh, it's not true. Where's your proof? I draw a line because then there are three. Where's your proof that any of this stuff is not true? You're not. You're just saying it's not true. Where's your proof? Okay. Where Where does it say this in the Bible? I mean, I feel like he's a puppet to, just to to wipe away everything Rob Bell taught. Now, Rob Bell didn't teach reincarnationism. Obviously, I'm talking about the universalism factor. I don't know. This 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 smells to high heaven to me, man. I really don't like this. Well, it appears that there's more than one Mars Hill church. I didn't realize this, but uh, uh, there's the one that Mark Driscoll he leads, 
in Washington, and there's also the one, and he started his in about 1996, I think. And then there's obviously Rob Bell's, the one he founded, which he's not the pastor of anymore, which was founded in 1999 in Michigan. And there's yet another one in California as well. Uh, can't remember exactly the guy's name that pastors it, but I was just looking at something kind of interesting. Uh, I think this is it. Yeah. Mark Driscoll's Mars Hill Church threatening legal action against other churches of the same name. Which I thought was kind of interesting. Who would Jesus sue? <laughs> um, not a pretty sad joke, actually. Um, okay, like I said, the Second Heart Mars Hill Church is founded in Grand Rapids by Rob Bell. Uh, my brother-in-law has been to his church and stuff. Said he likes Rob Bell. Said he's a nice guy. Says he's really tall. Um, and then the first one was the Mark Driscoll one. And it appears the third one. And now seems to be caught in the middle. It's a pastor of pastored in Sacramento, California, by a friend of this guy who wrote this, Scott Hagen. Scott planted another church years ago in Sacramento area, then moved to pastor a mega church in Michigan, and now is back leading at Mars Hill in Sacktown. I have Pastor Scott's permission to share what I am going to write next. Several weeks ago, Scott and his Sacramento congregation received a cease and desist order, which came from Seattle Mars Hill Church. They were told that the Seattle Mars Hill had copyrighted the name Mars Hill, and they demanded that the California Mars Hill churches stop using the name and any logos with, with similar lettering. Actually, I know quite a bit about copyright law. Actually... There's nothing wrong with starting a Mars Hill church in a different state, okay, because it would be a different incorporation. Uh, I, I do business all the time for 13 years, and, I mean, there could be another, and you can actually have another Mars Hill for a different type of thing, even in the same state. Like, you could have a Mars Hill candy, then you could have a Mars Hill church, and then you could have, like, a Mars Hill automotive, then you could have, like, a Mars Hill uh, McDonald's, or whatever you want to call it, you know what I mean? So... You can actually do that if it's a different type of entity as well. But being in a different state, you could have the same name. Copywriting a name, you can't copyright a name, actually. <laughs> uh, that's, like, impossible. Uh, literally, a copyright requires a significant amount of input for it to be copyrighted. Okay? They might have trademarked the name. Now, that might be the po that might be possible. And maybe the guy misspoke here and he meant trademarked. Or maybe uh, Mark Driscoll's Mars Hill doesn't know anything about copyright or trademark law and are just indicating to someone else. I, I kind of doubt that. They probably got lawyers and all that kind of stuff. Um, it would be trademark, not copyright. And with trademark, it only goes so far. Um, it may work there, but I mean the whole point is, is that there's supposed to be a Christian entity and you're not supposed to sue your brother and all this goofy stuff. That's what the Bible says, at least, right? Um, but, yeah, you can trademark stuff. I mean, for instance, Monster uh, Headphones, you know, the company that makes Monster Cable. Cables, it's called Monster Cable, I think. That guy is a Chinese dude. I uh, can't remember his name. He uh, sues pretty much everybody that uses the term Monster. Okay, he sued Monster Energy Drink. He sued DreamWorks for Monster Incorporated, saying that he was they were infringing on his Monster name. Uh, pretty much anybody that used Monster, I'm surprised he didn't sue Monster Trucks, you know what I mean? I mean, Monster Trucks were around before him, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, enough of that topic. Uh, let's get back to what he was talking about with regards to the afterlife. Reincarnationists will tell you that we have multiple successes. He's talking about reincarnation. Lives, that you will die and return and die and return and die and return, and that you have to pay off your karmic debt to the god or gods or universe that's not true that's not true well he's right about that but I mean I'm not trying to mock him I draw a line because then there are three additional options that fly under the banner of Christianity and the truth is that the first two are not true but people who love Jesus and will be with us in heaven do believe them and so I want to distinguish them though I also disagree with them. The fourth would be annihilationism, which is that... Actually, he's actually correct in the aspect of saying that they're still believers, because um, 
like I indicated, it's not heresy. And I think I've already covered the fact that the Fifth Ecumenical Council stuff already. Um, and annihilationism was one of the three viewpoints. So there's actually eternal torment, universalism, and annihilationism in the early church. But a lot of Protestants um, try to muddy the water and try to claim that they were all eternal torment believers, which is <laughs> really, really ridiculous. Because, I mean, <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I mean, if you read each one of the early fathers from 180 to 380, they all say different stuff, almost. I mean, literally, they all have different viewpoints. And showing that it's not a doctrine that was really well-founded, okay? It was one that they were experimenting and trying to figure out. I mean, the shepherd Her of Hermas, the shepherd of Hermas, almost made it into the Bible. Almost made it into the Bible. And the way he discusses the topic would be far more like a Catholic would than a Protestant, Okay. Now, what he said was that you could get saved in the afterlife. If you were a believer before you died and you went off track or whatever, then you would have to do penance in the afterlife, and then you would eventually, you would eventually make it to heaven or something like that. Now, one of the things that all the early fathers believed, all, was that there was an intermediate state. Intermediate state means between the time of death and the time of the judgment seat of Christ. Meaning that you're not in final hell or final heaven when you die. Okay? You're in the upper levels of Sheol or the lower levels of Sheol, according to basically every single early church father from 180 to 380. They all believe that you either went to the upper or lower levels of the afterlife. Okay? When David said, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither let my spirit see corruption. Um, what he's taught, the word hell there is actually an incorrect translation. It's the term Sheol in Hebrew and Hades in Greek, and it simply means the afterlife. Thou shalt not leave my spirit or soul in the afterlife. Okay, and that's true because that's the intermediate state. You're not, when you die, you go to the afterlife. You either go to the upper or lower levels. The lower levels is sort of hell like, and the upper levels is more heaven like or paradise. It's called paradise. Jesus said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise today to the guy on the cross next to him. It's also called Abraham's bosom, as in the, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, right? And Lazarus went to the lower levels of Sheol. Okay, that wasn't the final lake of fire. That was, and what is fire? What is the lake of fire? Okay, God, God's presence is a fire and brimstone according to the Old Testament. Okay, so in reality, it's God's presence. And it's not God torturing somebody, it has nothing to do with physicality. It's all a, it's a spiritual, it's a mental thing. It has to do with you being separated from God. When you're separated from God, there's nothing good left. Meaning, imagine the fruits of the spirits and the works of the flesh. Okay, imagine like fear. Okay, fear, anger, wrath, all this type of stuff is what you're going to be feeling in hell. You're not going to feel love, you're not going to feel peace, you're not going to feel patience and kindness and gentleness. You're not going to have any of that stuff. In hell... What it is, is you're separated from all goodness. So you are fear. You are anger. You are lonely. You are everything you can think of that's unbearable. And that's hell, okay? That is really what hell is. It's an eternal state. See, this is where people misunderstand. The term aeonos in the Greek there in Matthew 25, verse 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. He's referring to the goats when the sheep and the goats are separated. The term aeonos, if you look at the Greek Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, the usage of the term aeonos almost always refers to a finite period of time. Matter of fact, in the, in the, in the case of jo Jonah in the belly of the whale, it said he was in the be belly of the whale for aeonos, which is three days in the case of Jonah. So, it doesn't mean an eternal length of time. Let me just show you how, how ridiculous the whole theory of eternal torment is. Let me show you from a scientific viewpoint, because I'm a mechanical engineer. Okay, I'm all about logic, okay? If something ain't logical, I ain't going to believe it. And I can, show, I, I can poke holes all day in various topics that Protestants believe. The topic of eternal torment. Okay, a lot of Protestants, like Chuck Misler, for instance, and I respect Chuck Misler because he's a smart guy. He used to be an engineer as well. He says that God is outside the, the realm of space and time. Okay? I don't actually agree with him. I think he's wrong. I think God is in his own space and time, in eternal space and in eternal time, not on the same clock as we have here on Earth. Earth's clock is a finite clock. It's a finite existence clock. 
it's something you can measure a certain way okay we have different ways to measure time here on earth okay and actually it's pretty complex when you look at all the physics I mean time is relative also now God's time is an eternal time so when and the reason why I believe God is in time is because there would be there would be literally no sequence of events in heaven okay if, the, if we're in heaven and there's no time there is no sequence of events everything's happening at the same time which would make no sense to you okay so in reality there is a time in heaven it's just not the same as a time here okay and God does have space in heaven it's just not the same as the space here so but if you go with this theory that Chuck Miser presents that there is no time God is outside this realm of time if you go with that idea then how can you say hell is eternal torment forever because forever is measured by time by the limited understanding of time as you know it okay and if God is outside the realm of time how can you say that hell is a certain amount of time you can't say it's a certain amount of time you can't say it's forever because you don't know what you're talking about you see what I'm getting at see I took calc 1 2 3 4 5 I took differential equations I took all the crazy mathematical classes okay I've studied that how many different dimensions there are it's it's a far more complex thing than you can imagine okay and they make theories Newton made theories and then Einstein came along and made a better theory and, and I'm so he's gonna come along and make a better theory than Einstein because Einstein's theory doesn't fit everything it's a it's a model that tries to fit what he sees what we perceive in, in in reality but in reality it doesn't fit perfectly so it's not accurate it's not 100 percent correct now, now why is it Christians think they can't question something like eternal torment when that's made by an Saint Augustine it was just made up by somebody and there was a lot of different viewpoints in the early church a lot of them okay and most of them frankly were nothing like what Protestants teach today I mean I would say probably only 13 percent 10 15 percent of the church believed the same as a Protestant does today about hell literally and that that was my calculation based on all the stuff I studied almost you can almost find no early father that agrees with what Mark Driscoll is teaching here okay when people don't know Jesus and they die they simply cease to exist or they suffer for a while in hell and then eventually they cease to exist he's talking about annihilationism and actually some of them did believe annihilationism I've seen I've seen scholars argue that most were annihilationists. I've seen scholars argue that most were universalists. I've seen scholars argue that most were eternal torment believers. In reality, though, what we can say for a fact is that there were a lot in each camp. There were a lot of universalists, there were a lot of annihilationists, and there were a lot of, that believed in eternal torment. Okay? Which one's right, you know? And see, what these guys are doing is saying, well, there is no other option but eternal torment. But really, there is an option. There's three, two other options. And they don't accept these other options. And then they try to tell you it's heresy. This guy here is actually honest. He's not saying it's heresy. Um, he's saying it's wrong, but he's not saying it's heresy. Like John MacArthur says it's heresy, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. As I already demonstrated and proved earlier in uh, this video. That's not true, but some teach that. Number five, the Catholics will also teach something called purgatory, which is nowhere to be found in the Bible because it's not true. Okay, let me show you what's wrong with what he's saying there. I don't believe in purgatory or limbo. They're actually, what they are is they're theories based on the understanding of the intermediate state. Okay, they were trying to explain enigmas in scripture. And all the early fathers believed in the intermediate state. You don't go to final hell or final heaven when you die. Okay, you go to the intermediate state before the judgment seat of Christ. After you're judged, then you go to hell or heaven. Actually, heaven or hell. <laughs> okay, now... Purgatory is actually based as a theory based on the intermediate state, okay? And actually, the Shepherd of Hermas, which I told you almost made it into the Bible, says something kind of like purgatory, okay? And it almost made it into the Bible, literally, almost made it into the Bible, okay? So, I mean, there's actually, a, there's a, like five or ten books that almost made it into the Bible that are kind of like that, but, I mean, not on that topic, but, I mean, they're, like, different than Protestant dogma, Um What I wanted to mention about purgatory was that even though it's just a theological construct and isn't in the Bible, 
Um, what I wanted to say is also the idea that you go immediately to heaven or immediately to hell when you die, like the final heaven or final hell, is not in the Bible either. Okay, that's the, what it is. Is okay. It says if you look at the Greek and the Hebrew, it says you go to the afterlife. It doesn't say you go to final heaven, third heaven, or final hell. Matter of fact, Apostle Paul had mentioned about two visions. One was to third heaven and the other one was to paradise. They're not the same place. Okay. Literally through two different Greek words spoken there. They're two different places. Okay. <laughs> third heaven is the final state where we end up in the afterlife. Okay. In heaven. Okay. The paradise is not. Paradise is sort of like heaven 1.0 and you know final heaven th third heaven is actually heaven 2.0 you know it says in revelation new heavens new earth new jerusalem okay so earth is recreated and there's a new heaven and there's a new jerusalem Jer new jerusalem a cube that comes down from heaven 1500 miles by 1500 miles in size that's how big it is made of precious uh rocks like diamonds or whatever and rubies and stuff like that or some sort of structure like that at any rate what I'm trying to get at is that this idea and actually if you ask a Protestant that knows a lot about the history of this they'll say something like well the intermediate state was transferred to heaven they'll say that paradise was transferred to third heaven but guess what that's not biblical either there's nothing in the bible that says that it's just like purgatory it's just made up okay but a lot of christians think they end up in final heaven when they die but that's not what the bible says matter of fact that's what gnostics used to teach which is an error they were the ones that were teaching that christ didn't come in the flesh and they taught people go directly to final hell or directly to final heaven when they die but they will teach that people can die and then suffer for a while as part of the uh, finishing of their work of salvation so that ultimately they might be in heaven. Uh, well, see, that's a misunderstanding of purgatory. Um, I think it, if they were going to do it theologically correctly, what you would say is that um, they're separated from God because they're not believers. And, then, and, and what they believe is that they were believers before they died. But let's say they're in sin. They're separated from God, and they're allowed to experience this until their heart is in the right position to where they can accept God correctly again, and then they would make it to heaven. That would be the proper way to define it if you were going to believe in purgatory, but some of them define it like you, you work off your sins or something like that, which is not correct. You can't pay for your sins. And, and by the way, by the way, God punishing you forever in hell can't pay for your sins either. So why does God need to do it? That's not true. Thus I'm older. The question is, which is the sixth point, what does the Bible say? <laughs> what does the Bible what say? What does the Bible say? In, in Greek or English? Not what do all the scholars and the critics and the interpretations and the perspectives. Scholars and the critics. Really, okay, let me show you where the whole fallacy of all these topics, every single topic I ever talk about, all, what is the fallacy? The fallacy is that they trust English translations translated by people who have the same theology as you. That's called circular reasoning. Okay, if I make a translation of a document to fit my theology and then I extract my theology from that document, that's called reverse, I mean, circular reasoning. It's illogical, okay? If you take, the, if you, it, the, this is the whole issue I have. All these translations translate it to fit eternal torment because they're all Protestants translating the scriptures. Protestants that believe in it. Those things are important and can be helpful. But what does the scripture say? <laughs> so with that in mind. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, it's not the real scriptures, the Greek and Hebrew. It's these English ones and that we're supposed to believe that these English ones are perfectly translated. Okay, but all you got to do is do a little bit of digging and you can find errors galore in different translations. Just do a little bit of digging and you'll see how many errors, just how many are in different translations. I mean, the King James Bible has the word Easter in it. Do you know where the word Easter comes from? Estor, a pagan fertility goddess. Okay, so is Christ affiliated with a pagan fertility goddess? Easter bunnies and, and all this stuff and eggs? No, of course not. But see, they still translated it into the King James Bible.
So it's not perfect, all you King James only people. In just a moment, we're going to read the words of Jesus Christ. The most loving, humble, helpful servant who has ever lived in the history of the world. Furthermore, it is Jesus who speaks of hell more than anyone in the whole Bible. Jesus speaks of hell roughly 13% of the time in his teaching. He speaks of hell, judgment, punishment, and the like. Roughly half of his parables are in reference to punishment, hell, and judgment. And as I mentioned, the term aeonos doesn't mean an eternal length of time. All this theology, this physical burning stuff, comes from Gnosticism. It teaches that the physical needs to be punished because it's evil. It's made by the demurge. Jesus didn't teach that you're eternally tormented in hell. This is a translation that's been skewed from the Greek into English so that you think Jesus said that. Okay, Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say people are tormented in hell forever. Okay, they are put in hell as a punishment to bring them to heaven. Okay, it's okay. Now let me ask you something. Let me just tell you, let me just put something in front of you here. Let's say Kim Jong Il was God. Okay? Now, for all intents and purposes, this sucks. Obviously, nobody would want Kim Jong Il to be God, would they? No, that would be really bad. But let's just say Kim Jong Il was God. Now, if Kim Jong Il decided to torture people in the gulags for 5 years straight, would you think he's a good God? Would you think he's a loving God? Would you think Kim Jong-il is a loving person to torture you for five years in his gulags? He has to... Kim Jong-un is his son. Okay, there's Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un. Okay, Kim Jong-un is the one that's currently reigning, who just killed his girlfriend by firing squad, or ex-girlfriend, because he, he was jealous or something. And he has 200,000 people in gulags right now. Political dissenters, uh, other types of crimes, stealing, theft, whatever. Okay, now, so here's the thing, okay? If Kim Jong-il is evil for torturing people in gulags, why is God good to do it? Okay? See, what people have done here is they make God in their image. See, these people who made this theory up, this eternal torment, are very twisted people. I mean, think about it. Doesn't it make sense that people make God in their image? I mean, we have Jesus' painting as a white person because white people want Jesus to be white. And then we have black people that make Jesus black because they want Jesus to be black. Everybody makes God into their own image when you're really supposed to be making your image to reflect God's image. Okay? People in Rome were very, very murderous and barbarous people. They, they had the Colosseum games where they were killing people for entertainment. They would go and sack cities all the time, killing and butchering people all the time. So it would be, seem natural that the God they would come up would be with would be one who would be torturous and murderous and killing. And Wouldn't that make sense? Okay, So they would turn the God of Christianity into a torturer because they torture. You see what I'm getting at? So instead of it being a God of love disciplining people to bring them to repentance, it becomes a God of torture who likes to torture people in hell for eternity okay we in the providence of god as a debate around this issue rages within christianity we arrive at jesus words on this very important issue some would say jesus is so loving certainly jesus doesn't believe in hell i would say the most loving person who has ever lived not only believes in hell, but clearly, emphatically, repeatedly teaches on it, which must mean that our sin is more damnable than we can fathom. If it requires the most loving person to speak in the most stark of terms. The existence of hell, the instruction by Jesus of hell, should reveal to us how sinful sin truly is and how rebellious we really are. 
You see, what it is, is it really is an eternal separation. If you if you listen to any of these near-death experiences, they'll describe basically what I'm saying. Now, you have to be very careful with these near-death experiences because some of them are just visions. You'll have these people that will write a book on a vision. There's this one named, uh, I think her name was Mary Baxter, who had visions of Christ giving, him, giving her of hell, which was all bullshit because she had devils stabbing people and torturing people in hell. Okay, she didn't. She had a vision from the devil, or she just made it up, or whatever. I'm talking about people who actually died and actually went to the afterlife. Okay, not people who had visions. Okay, if you if you talk to those people, they'll tell you that it's an eternal state. They feel like they'll they'll be there forever. There's no duration. But then guess what? All the people who ever have these hell experiences, what happens? They all of a sudden get out of it miraculously, and they meet Jesus, and they talk to Jesus, and Jesus saves them from hell and next thing you know they come back to life and they're a christian isn't that odd why is it every time they have these near-death experiences people are saved by christ from hell they're literally in hell they're experiencing it they can tell it's an eternal state the next thing you know they're saved from it they have no control over it they know that they're doomed if they if god doesn't have any grace or mercy on them but see god's mercy endures forever See, there's about 100 Bible verses. Check out my other videos. I go through 30 verses that literally contradict eternal torment. Is every family of the world blessed? Is every person of the world blessed? There's actually two different verses. One verse says that every person in the world will be blessed. It says that Sodom and Gomorrah's fortunes will be re-established. Sodom and Gomorrah, which, by the way, a lot of people don't have any clue about that topic either because they've never read the book of Jasher. <laughs> Which shows that they are not homosexuals. They were heterosexuals, and they were freaks. They were killers. They killed. And they skill. They killed. They robbed. They they put magistrates in place to to enforce these psychotic laws that anybody that came into their city from outside the plane, they could kill. They could steal. They could rob. They could do whatever they wanted to them. A, a, a poor man could come in begging. They'll tie him up in the middle of the city, give him money, but they won't give him any food, and they'll let him starve to death. That's what they would do to people. Okay, And if you ever questioned their laws, they would put you on the rack and stretch you. That's what they did in Sodom. Okay, God totally wiped it off the map. But guess what? It says that Sodom's fortunes will be reestablished. It says wicked countries all around the earth will be coming and worshiping the Lord. It says this in different verses in the Old Testament. It says a lot of stuff like this that just completely contradicts eternal torment. Every knee bowing. Uh, it says that through one man sin entered the world and through another the world is saved. It says things like this. It, it, and it uses the same term for all. All will be all were lost, all are saved. I mean, does it it must mean all believers and you got to add in your own words. You got to add in words to make it say what you want it to say. So, we're going to read the words of Jesus together. Uh, in Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31 and as you're finding that place in your bible or on your app i do want to show you what the bible says about the fact that we are two parts body and soul second uh, corinthians 5 8 the apostle paul says to christians we would rather be away from the body and at home with the lord that is in reference to believers. You and I, as image bearers of God, are two parts. We are a physical body and a spiritual soul. No, we're three parts. Death this is, is no the result of about. sin, and our physical body, upon death, ceases to function, goes into the ground. Yeah, temporarily, in the intermediate state, you're just a mind and a spirit. But in the final afterlife, you receive your glorious new body. So you have a new physical body. There's three dimensions to a human mind, body, soul. Even secular non-believers know this. Found in his bearing. But our spiritual soul continues to live beyond death. It's not just that. Your body's resurrected as well. You receive a new glorious body. This guy is teaching basically Gnosticism. Gnosticism believes the flesh is evil. That's why you won't have a physical body in heaven, according to Gnostics. Okay, He's teaching Reformed theology, which comes from St. Augustine, who used to be a...